Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe again uh, on this Wealth Wednesday. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. And, uh, you know, it's doing, it's, we had a great event uh, at the weekend, so that's why I let you know. Uh, as well, it turned out we had a full house and uh, great information, great, uh, you know, great networking. And uh, it was great to uh, just see everybody again and uh, hear uh, Femi's story. Uh, we had Nick, the real estate agent, was there. So he's given his perspective as a realtor. And obviously, I was sharing my perspective as the investor. But we had a great event. And hopefully, if all goes well, we'll be doing another event, probably about another six weeks. Uh, another uh, student of mine, uh, Corliss and Fritz, they bought their house here in Washington, D.C. And uh, done the demo. And we are now going through the permitting process to get the building permit. Hopefully, we'll get that soon. And once that's done, then we'll start the renovations and uh, and then maybe we'll do a um, uh, an event uh, at their house um, kind of midway through the rehab phase. So uh, look out for that. And again, we had a great event. So thank you for everyone for, for coming on Saturday and I look forward to seeing you uh, the next one. So today we're going to talk about uh, identifying neighborhoods with strong rental demand. And uh, as you can see, that's a very, very important topic. If you're looking to buy properties, obviously, if you're going to do a, a long-term hold, uh, you want to make sure that you buy in areas where you can get tenants. Not just any tenants, but hopefully the tenants that you're looking uh, to rent to. You know what my desired tenants are? My desired tenants are tenants who are what I call tier one. They're going to pay the rent. Uh, they're going to take care of the property. Pleasant to deal with and hopefully stay a long time. So that's what I'm looking for. And uh, these uh, particular tenants, um, you know, I need to know who they are, where they, you know, where they want to live, where they don't want to live. And, uh, and therefore, hopefully, if they stay a long time, then I can get my ROI, return on investment on my property. So that's the reason why we are, um, you know, uh, talk about this topic today is because a lot of people ask me, you know, Dr. Joe, hey, uh, you know, where should I buy? Should I buy here in Baltimore? Should I buy in D.C.? Should I buy in Florida, should I buy in wherever? Um, my answer to that, it, it depends. And it's obviously the local market is important. And so today we're going to kind of talk about some of the issues that you need to consider uh, when you're identifying areas where to invest in. And the last thing you want to do is to buy a house or property in a certain area and, uh, and you can't rent it because nobody wants to live there or you can't get the rent that you want because demand is weak and uh and so forth and so on so that's the reason why we're having this topic today and as usual <clears throat> please put your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them in about 20 minutes from now uh anything to do with real estate investing anything to do with uh, landlord and tenants uh acquiring financing uh any issues or problems that you're facing uh and where you want my perspective feel free to put them in the chat box and i'll get to them shortly so the question is, uh, why is identifying high rental neighborhoods crucial, crucial uh, for investors? You know, um, you know, you know, it's it's really fundamental in making a well-informed decisions uh, because uh, your goal, I think, is to have a prof profitable business, and uh, where you buy is absolutely critical uh, in that decision-making process. You want to identify properties. Hopefully, you'll get a high yield. And, uh, and not all rental areas are the same. Not all neighborhoods are the same. You know, you want to look at things such as, uh, you know, strong, consistent demand for your rentals. Is that area where you're thinking about, is it good for that? Are you going to get a steady street of income uh, once you have it available for rent? And obviously, you want to minimize vacancies. So these are some of the reasons why it's so important uh, to identify areas. So we're going to go into a little dive deep dive uh, into uh, into this subject matter during today's live stream. Uh, we're going to have a pretty comprehensive, multifaceted approach to this. And uh, we're going to look at things like demographics, the importance of demographics, uh, the importance of economic trends, and also uh, the allure, I suppose, of local amenities. Uh, what's the big deal about where you are, where this property is, and why should people want to live there? Uh, so all these things uh, come into play when you're deciding, should I invest in uh, neighborhood A or city A or you know region A or state A versus B? These are all the factors and considerations that you want to do. So today we're going to kind of go into a little deep dive 
because uh, I think it's a very, very important topic. So let's just get down to it. And number one is the importance of market research. Obviously, you want to understand the market that you're thinking of entering. And, uh, you know, you don't want any, you don't want any surprises after you bought the property. Um, you know, so market research is absolutely indispensable. It provides you with a bird's eye view of the locality uh, that you're thinking of considering, uh, the landscape, the economic and demographic trends that's taken place. And uh, also uh, it's, you know, market, you know, market research is going to give you an idea of the indicators of the neighborhoods that you're thinking of investing in. Uh, is it, uh, you know, is there high potential for growth? Is there high potential for uh, strong rental demand? Uh, because these are some of the things that you want to do in order to make what we call an informed decision. Uh, so by understanding some of the intricacies, um, you know, you can sort of navigate the complexities of the real estate market and therefore identify neighborhoods that, uh, you know, that obviously meet your short term, but hopefully some of your long term goals and they align with your investment objectives. So, uh, so market research is absolutely important. And some of the action items that you may want to consider uh, as part of the uh, market research are things like conduct a demographic analysis of the area that you're thinking of investing. Uh, use uh, government or sort of, uh, you know, census data uh, to, to find things like population trends. Are people moving in, moving out? Household income levels. What are the typical uh, incomes, um, you know, in the area that you're thinking of investing? because obviously the income is going to be determinant of how much people can pay for rent and other de uh, demographic factors, uh, you know, you may want to consider as well. The other thing you may want to consider as part of the action item is a look at the economic conditions in the area that uh, you're thinking of investing. Uh, what are the employment rates? Uh, what's, uh, you know, are there major employers in the area? And what's, are there any economic uh, developments taking place? Because that will gauge, that will give you an idea of whether the area is uh, increasing or decreasing. And also you want to look at, um, you know, infrastructure uh, developments that may be taking place. Are there any planned uh, or ongoing commercial activities, uh, infrastructure activities, projects, transportation links, commercial developments? Uh, these are some of the things that will uh, impact your, um, you know, your desirability uh, as a rental, because obviously as the economy is growing, then people are going to go there towards jobs. And if people are going to go for jobs, they're going to need, typically they're going to need rental uh, properties and, and so on. So that's the action number one. Uh, uh, market research is number one. Uh, the second topic I think is important is really to understand the demographics. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more details as to what I mean by demographics here. Uh, you know, it's kind of the evolving landscape in the area. Um, you know, things like, um, you know, is there a trend in, um, you know, things like the age distribution? Um, you know, are, if you're catering to young people or older people, what's the distribution of ages, household composition, families, singles, uh, income levels, these are all demographics. And because that will, in, you know, that will have an impact on the types of properties that people are looking for, uh, the locations where people want to live, and also the amenities that people or renters are looking for. These are some of the things uh, when I talk about demographics. And so, for example, if you're catering to, if there's a surge, let's say, in young people, uh, young professionals uh, within a city like Washington, D.C., New York, Miami, L.A., or whatever, any city, there's going to be, uh, you know, what it tells us is that there's probably going to be an, an increase in demand for studios or one-bedroom units. Uh, especially near employment hubs where the jobs are and possibly where there are lifestyle amenities like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, things for recreation. Uh, conversely, if the, if the demographics is increasing in terms of families, then there may be, uh, you know, uh, a demand, a growing demand for larger homes and uh, with access to good schools and parks and other recreational facilities. So adapting the demographics, um, you know, requires you to stay abreast of what's going on. And so that, again, what the trends are in your locality, and that'll give you an idea of whether there's a demand, increasing demand, reducing demand, and things like that for rental properties. So uh, I think uh, that's number, so that's the, what's it called, in terms of the, um, 
uh, let's have a look here. Let's get my notes together. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, demographics is uh, conduct a demographic analysis, evaluate economic conditions, and, um, you know, and so on. So that's uh, action items for there. Number three is, I think it's, um, this, this is an interesting one. It's sort of the economic trends and their impact. Um, you know, economics is critical. Uh, the strength of your local economy is going to have a huge impact on whether there's a, a growing, uh, if there's an increase in population or a decrease in population. Uh, as you know, I like the Washington, D.C. area and because uh, typically capital cities around the world tend to be the most um, resilient and because that's where the money is. That's where the government is. That's where they spend the money. And um, people want a piece of that action. So they tend to gravitate towards the capital area. So that's one of the reasons why I like, uh, you know, the Washington, D.C. area. Obviously, I live here, but the economies tend to be a lot more uh, resilient, tend to be a lot stronger. And therefore, real estate is very tied, closely tied to the, con the local economy. So it's really important for you to understand the economic impacts or, you know, what's taking economic trends, I suppose, in the area where you are considering, uh, you know, investing in. So certain things like uh, employment growth. Is there a trend? Uh, are there jobs, um, you know, over there? Because if, if there's an increase in uh, jobs, then obviously it's going to increase in number of people that want to live there. Uh, are industries expanding or declining? Uh, and what's the overall overall economic health of the jurisdiction that you're thinking of investing? So, for example, if there's job growth, uh, as I said before, then people are going to come there for jobs. And if they come to the area, they're going to need somewhere to stay, which means that there's probably going to be an increase in demand for rental opportunities. There'll be an uptick in rental demand uh, as people search for employment opportunities. Similarly, neighborhoods um, you know, uh, that are benefit from economic revitalization uh, also tend to witness increased uh, demand or uh, for for uh, potential renters uh, and therefore that's going to boost demand for rentals and also rental rates or rental prices and uh, also you may want to you know monitor you need to monitor economic trends closely and use them as a guide uh, for strategic um, you know investment decisions so by investing in areas where there's a strong demand uh, then what it means is that there's going to be a, a steady demand for rental properties, uh, which means that for you as an investor, there's probably going to be potential for reducing vacancies and, uh, and which in turn means that you're going to have a better return on your investment. So local economy is very, very important. The strength of your local e uh, economy is absolutely critical for your viability as, a, as an investor of rental properties. So uh, it's really important to understand what's taking place, anticipate market shifts, and, uh, and adjust your plans accordingly. So what are some of the action items associated with economic uh, trends? I would say um, things like monitor the local and national economic indicators. What's taking place? Uh, is the economy growing, uh, stagnant, reducing? And also, you may want to conduct uh, you know, area-specific uh, economic analysis. Uh, of the neighborhood, of the city, of the region that you're thinking of investing. Uh, and look at things like, uh, you know, local economy uh, strength, like uh, unemployment rates, uh, medium income levels, future e economic development plans. And uh, because by integrating all these economic trends, uh, it really helps you identify which areas are better to invest in and uh, which areas are likely to give you a stronger demand for your rental units. And as a result of that, you probably have higher occupancy levels. Okay, so that's number three. And we'll go to uh, number four in a second. But again, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm going to get to them in about five, about 10 minutes from now. And, uh, you know, let's, let's get the questions in and I'll do as much as I can for the Ask Dr. Joe Q&A session. So the fourth thing I want to cover is uh, in terms of the importance uh, of, of, of in helping you identify where to invest for your rental properties is really the role of local amenities. Um, you know, you know, I mean, things like, uh, 
you know, really the, the, what's going on in the locally? Uh, you know, why should people live there? What's the neighborhood appeal? And uh, because, the, you know, the attractiveness of the area is going to be uh, important to determine whether people want to live there. Uh, amenities which are very popular with uh, renters are things like parks, schools, uh, shopping center, recreational facilities, public transportation, you know, entertainment venue, venues. These are all things that people look for when they're considering whether to live in a particular, uh, particular area or not. What's the quality of life for residents, uh, you know, uh, who want to live there or don't want to live there? You know, so as a result of that, investors, you and I need to sort of assess the availability and the quality of local amenities uh, when we decide we want to invest in a place uh, or not. So things like uh, highly uh, desirable amenities that people look for, or things like, um, you know, as I said, schools, recreation, transportation, and, uh, and they will have a, a, an impact on whether people want to live there, the desirability, and also the, you know, the demand for your units uh, if and when you have them. So, you know, keep tabs of that. Uh, what's going on locally? Are there any sort of new uh, amenities or improvements that's taking place or going to be offered? Um, because they could signal neighborhood growth and, uh, and therefore offering you as the investor, um, you know, opportunities to enter the market before the prices escalate. So you can be a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, you know, for example, I know that uh, some parts, like, let's say taking Washington, D.C., there was a time they were expanding the metro system and the subway systems. Uh, and typically, once you have rapid transport, uh, it tends to bring people in because people want to you know, be able to get in and out of a particular area. And therefore, if you can go in and buy uh, before uh, these uh, projects are completed, sometimes you can buy, you can be ahead of the curve and therefore, you know, be there um, you know, and get in at a reasonable price compared to others who may come in later once everything is completed. So what are some of the action items associated with local amenities? Uh, research and evaluate your local amenities uh, before investing uh, in particular area, you know, do a thorough analysis of the local amenities that's offered. Um, you know, consider both the current landscape and also the planned developments that could take place uh, in determining the neighborhood's appeal. Uh, market properties based on, uh, you know, nearby amenities. So when you are advertising your properties, you want to highlight your proximity to some of these desirable uh, amenities that hopefully will be of interest to uh, prospective tenants. I know when I advertise my property, I always mention close to things like, I do a lot of Section 8, so close to public transportation is very, very important, whether it be buses uh, or whether it be uh, the subway system, uh, close proximity to shopping, um, you know, proximity to parks and recreational facilities is very important. So I tend to highlight those in my adverts, uh, along with the usual things like photographs, video, virtual tours, and things like that when I'm marketing my properties. So again, uh, if you are close to desirable uh, neighborhood, you know, activities or amenities, you want to definitely include that in your listings. So really by strategically investing, uh, in areas with attractive local amenities, uh, you can increase the appeal of your property and uh, hopefully give you that competitive edge compared to, um, you know, other investors. Uh, so again, this is uh, really helpful in terms of attracting, but also retaining, um, you know, tenants once they're in your property, which in turn will mean that you get a higher return on your investment. Uh, number five is uh, optimizing, what's the time, 720? Optimizing rental pricing. Obviously, pricing at the end of the day is very, very important uh, in terms of uh, determining the desirability of your property. So you want to obviously optimize, uh, you know, the price of your properties is critical. Uh, you don't want to overprice it, uh, you know, and therefore you lose potential uh, tenants. But likewise, you don't want to underprice it and therefore leaving money on the table. Uh, so you want to make sure that your property is priced aggressively and such that it can attract the kind of tenants that you're looking for. So there's always a delicate balance uh, between you know, being priced not too high, but again, not too low. And, uh, and therefore you can attract tenants quickly and hopefully you can reduce your vacancies and um, you know, get your profits uh, accordingly. So factors uh, to consider uh, in determining the optimal prices for your property are things like what's the market demand, 
uh, the property location and proximity to amenities, the ones I've just talked about. Uh, also, you want to do some comparative rental uh, analysis to find out what uh, others are charging for similar units in close by. Uh, so understand the local rates is absolutely important. Uh, it's good to know what others are charging. It's good to know what the market is bearing demand wise. And obviously certain things like the property size, the condition, and some of the unique features will have an impact on the, the, you know, the price that you want to uh, rent this thing for. Uh, some areas there's seasonal fluct fluctuations. Uh, some areas, uh, you know, it could be in a uh, resort area. So obviously during the summer, it tends to be high season. So you can usually charge a little bit more. Uh, during the cold or off market, you can usually uh, not price it somewhere. So, you know, you're sort of um, may have to do some seasonal adjustments uh, based on, you know, certain areas uh, that you're in. And so in Washington, D.C., we don't really have those seasonal adjustments so much but as compared to resort or uh, recreational places and so on. So what are some of the action items you may want to consider in terms of optimizing your rental prices? Uh, yeah, you want to do a, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, comprehensive market research. Uh, you want to gather data about what uh, other people are, you know, charging comparables uh, for similar units of similar size, style, and amenities. Uh, you also want to check some of these online platforms, uh, Zillow, Redfin, uh, you know, Craigslist. Um, you know, these are all online platforms, even contacting property management and uh, real estate agents who can give you some accurate data as to what others are charging for similar units. Uh, also, you want to evaluate your property's unique value. Uh, what some of the unique things that you have in your property, um, you know, that could be attractive to prospective tenants. And also, you want to adjust your price uh, based on feedback and occupancy levels. If you're, if you want to increase your occupancy level, you may have to reduce the price. Likewise, uh, you know, and so on. Okay, so really, by strategically optimizing rental pricing. Uh, investors can enhance their property's appeal and uh, hopefully be in a position to attract potential tenants and which in turn will, um, you know, enable faster occupancy and which in turn will reduce your turnover costs. And then finally, number six is navigating setbacks and challenges. Uh, yeah, I mean, we all have setbacks and challenges in all our work. Uh, I've had it. Uh, you know, things don't always play out the way you want it to be. Uh, sometimes you get hit by a curveball, uh, but you know, I mean, in, you know, being a landlord, being a, a portfolio lender, being a portfolio landlord, uh, long-term landlord, I mean, it has setbacks. Uh, there's unexpected maintenance issues and challenges. There's the uh, regulatory, it could be landlord-tenant laws in the locality. Uh, there's economic downturns and you have difficult tenants. Uh, I mean, these are all obstacles uh, that will impact your profitability and uh, it's going to test your resolve as well. However, by anticipating uh, some of these issues in advance, you can put in place proactive strategies uh, that will help you, the investor, navigate through these difficult and um, you know, challenges, uh, hopefully a lot more effectively and therefore um, you know, ensuring your uh, I suppose, your resilience and long-term success. So a crucial part of navigating um, challenges, uh, you know, is a really a comprehensive understanding of the local regularity, uh, regulations, uh, laws, local laws, especially as it pertains to housing condition, housing code, um, you know, landlord-tenant evictions and so on. I mean, it's really important to understand what they are locally because that will dictate to you what you can and cannot do. Uh, other things you may want to consider in terms of, uh, you know, mitigating setbacks and challenges is really having a, a, a team, a pool of reliable contractors and service providers who can address things like maintenance issues, uh, you know, both promptly and efficiently. And, and so minimizing downturn and hopefully minimizing, um, you know, disturbance and aggravation uh, and dis dissatisfaction for your tenants. So the other thing is uh, to minimize setbacks and challenges is uh, have effective tenant uh, screening processes in place. Uh, you know me, I'm a real stickler for screening. As I, my experience is that most of the problems that you're going to have 
as a landlord is because you just got the wrong person in your house. Uh, and the roots of that is that, uh, you, you know, something didn't work out on your screening. Uh, so it's really important to have a screening process, screen policies, and communicate, uh, you know, effectively with your tenants. Uh, so you can mitigate risks associated with property damage and uh, non-payment or payment del delinquency. So what are some of the action items in terms of navigating setbacks and uh, challenges? You know, stay informed and compliant with local uh, regulations. Uh, you know, understand your local housing laws, wherever you are, and the do's and don'ts. Um, you know, consider joining a rental uh, a local uh you know real estate investor group so you can learn from others you know so you can stay update and learn from the experiences and setbacks from other people um develop a, a network of reliable contractors uh cultivate relationships uh, with skilled professionals who can quickly address any maintenance issues that come up uh, and um, also implement thorough screening and maintain open communication to your tenants uh, establish clear criteria for tenant selection, um, uh, foster positive relationships with your tenants uh, through regular communications and being responsive to their concerns. So by preparing for and effectively managing uh, the challenges uh, that come up, you know, hopefully uh, you can uh, not let those uh, challenges and setbacks uh, throw you off and hopefully you can keep rolling, roll with the punches, as they say, and so you can protect your assets and ensure a steady, regular, consistent income stream. And then finally, in conclusion, uh, the journey through identifying, you know, the best areas to invest in is not easy. There's lots of things to consider, things like demographics, economic trends, local amenities, you know, uh, rental prices. These are all things that affect uh, the desirability uh, of your investment and whether you should invest in area A or area B. Uh, but they're essential components. You know, your mindset is important, your philosophy. Uh, where do you want to invest? Why do you want to invest there? What kind of people are you looking for? Why do they want to live? Why should they rent from you? Uh, these are important things to consider on your journey to become a real time, uh, you know, a successful real estate investor. You know, success in this field is not just about, um, you know, short term gains, it's about the long haul. It's about being able to ride out storms. It's being, it's being able to sort of pick yourself up once you get knocked down or hit by a curveball every now and then. So it's really important to stay, um, you know, uh, to be resilient and uh, be able to withstand some of these market fluctuations that's going to take place. And also some of the day-to-day -day operational challenges, which are, are inevitable uh, as a, uh, a real estate investor. So investors need to understand market analysis uh evolving trends uh needs preferences of tenants and, uh, and also how to navigate setbacks and strategic um you know disappointments so again uh it's really good i enjoy being a landlord i think it's a real estate investing uh, owning real uh, assets is absolutely critical uh and you can do it it's not easy but it can be done and hopefully some of the information i shared with you today will help you on your journey to identify uh, you know, properties, desirable properties and desirable locations and so on. So that, my friend, is about 7.30. Uh, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box. I'm going to go to Q&A shortly. Uh, so put them in the chat box and we're going to go to ask Dr. Joe. Uh, as always, if you've got any emails, if you want any questions, you can always shoot me an email. Uh, I'll try my best to get uh, and respond to your uh, email. And, um, you know, for those people who has immediate questions, uh, you know, detail issues, problems, challenges that they're facing. Uh, if you want to book an hour with me, that's fine. You can book a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with me. Uh, all you have to do is go to my website, joeasimo.com, www.joeasimo.com, and book a session. Uh, it's the Ask Dr. Joe button on the website. Uh, it is paid. Uh, it's $175 for one hour. So, again, just full disclosure. Uh, but it's really, really worthwhile. Uh, I just had one uh, yesterday, in fact, and uh, it's uh, it's it's been a, it's good to be able to for people to bounce ideas from me. Uh, I can share some of my experiences and wisdom based on 20, 35 years of experience about what works, what doesn't work. So um, if you have any questions uh, that you think uh, you know uh, you could do with my one-on-one -on -one attention, uh, please uh, go to the website joe joeasamoa.com. 
and uh, go press the Ask Dr. Joe button. And with that said, my friend, let's go to Q&A. So again, we had a great time on Saturday at the uh, uh, Burr Networking and Education event. Looking forward to another one, probably in about another six or seven, eight weeks. Another property, another student. And uh, again, my goal is to encourage you, motivate you uh, to take action. At the end of the day, you have to take action if you want to reach your financial independence goals. You can't reach your goals by watching videos all day. You can't reach your goals by, you know, going to a, a rear meeting. It takes action at some point. And uh, if I can be of assistance to you, uh, please let me know and I'll do the best that I can. So with that said, uh, let's go down to uh, Q&A and let's see what we got today. Hello, Dr. Joe from Texas. Hi, Get Lobster. Hope you're doing well. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, let's have a look. Greetings from uh, Phoenix. That's uh, Doe 2. Hope you're doing good. Uh, Texas is in the house. Hi, Dr. Joe. Joining from DC. DC Intellectual Conversation with BJ. How are you doing? Intellectual Conversation with BJ. Uh, again, if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them uh, as soon as possible. Let's have a look. Outside of outdoor maintenance, what indoor inspections or routine maintenance do you do you for your do you I do I suppose for your units? E.g., filter change, refrigerator, core checks, etc. How do you structure these visits? Okay, there. Um, typically, what you may want to consider are uh, maintenance checks every change of season. So there are four seasons, and the big ones obviously is uh, you know winter and summer. Uh, that's the biggest change. So uh, you know you can do in pre preparation for those changes. Uh, you may want to check out the uh, your HVAC system, your heating system, your cooling system. Make sure they're working before it gets too hot or too cold. Uh, if your tenants are responsible for, um, you know, uh, maintaining the yard or maintaining the lawn, you want to give them a heads up. Um, you know that uh, you know it's their responsibility uh, before uh, the spring season. Um, in terms of uh, filter changes. Uh, I buy, uh, you know, several spare, uh, you know, filters and I show the tenants how to change the filter and, uh, and then I leave them with several, um, you know, filters so they can change the filters on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of the appliances, I have uh, home warranties on all my appliances. So if something goes wrong, I usually get the home warranty company to take care of it. Um, you know, yeah, so those are the kind of things. I also I can I send emails out to the tenant, and uh, you know in advance if there's a major rain session, uh, I usually send a text message out to the tenants to check the drains and uh, make sure the house uh, is ready for a heavy rainstorm. Um, you know, so I do inspections usually once a year. Uh, for my new tenants, I do a little bit more regularly, maybe once a quarter uh, for the first year. And uh, but these are all part of my policies and uh, that I have in place. Um, and obviously, if something goes wrong, uh, if my maintenance person goes out there, then you know, they usually are able to give me an update on how the house is and take care of the problem, whatever that may be. OK, we're taking over a new duplex with two tenants next week. Congratulations. Uh, we'll deliver a new owner letter to them in person. OK, congratulations. Please share tips for when we meet them so we can have a good start to the relationship huh okay so the situation here at get lobster is that uh he's buying a new property a duplex uh, in a couple of weeks time that well next week and uh, he's got two new tenants that he's going to be inheriting um so uh he's going to deliver a new owner letter just introducing himself and let them know who he is and uh and so on that's important uh obviously you want to make sure that you have the um the security deposit is transferred over to you uh, from the previous owner. Uh, you want to make sure you have a copy of the lease uh, from the previous owner. And you want to obviously have an idea of their books, if they owe you any money or owe them any money. And uh, because you're going to be inheriting these tenants. Other things to improve the relationship. Uh, I'm into communications. And so uh, I think it's always a good idea to check in with your tenants every now and then. Uh, I think it's a good idea in terms of relationship building to uh, to do little things to go an extra yard, 
to let them know that uh, you appreciate them. You're very happy that they stay in your property. Things like, um, you know, you know me, I do Mother's Day gifts, bouquets of flowers, Christmas presents, and all this kind of different thing. These are um, exercises in, um, you know, customer service. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot to this uh, in terms of relationship, because what I found is that if the tenants are happy, they're more likely to pay the rent, more likely to take care of the property, more likely to stay a long time. And, uh, you know, they're just pleasant people generally if they're happy. So I focus on those things that uh, hopefully will make them happy and hopefully will get them to stay longer. Okay, good. Uh, let's have a look. I was on a voucher meet and lease and landlords were asked by the moderator, is your rent reasonable to the area? I thought the rent amount was set by DCHA, not the landlord for Section 8 tenants. Okay, so this is a question more specific to, to Washington, D.C. Uh, they have what we call meet and lease. Uh, these are events, usually two or three times a month, where landlords uh, you know, can share what their units are available, and tenants who are looking can also hear from landlords. So that's what we call by meet and lease for those people outside. And uh, the question here is, uh, they ask, is your rent reasonable? So now they've changed the rules around since uh, July of last year, where your rent that you're asking for has to be within a certain uh, you know, uh, range. Otherwise, it's not considered, quote unquote, reasonable. So they want to know, is your rent reasonable? Is it? Uh, how do you determine that? There's a website that you can go to, plug in the address, number of bedrooms. It'll give you an idea of what uh, they're likely to pay. And uh, so if you're looking to rent to a voucher holder, then your rent should be, you know, close to what the website says. And if it's way out, then, uh, you know, if the website says, let's say $2,000 and you're asking $3,000, uh, it may not be considered reasonable. And therefore, if it's not reasonable, then the housing authority is going to ask you, hey, do you want to um, charge a reasonable rent? Or do you want, what do you want to do? Because they can only pay so much. And uh, it's almost like if you, if you don't want to come down to what they suggest, then they will not process the uh, application any further. So it's always important to, um, you know, to understand uh, if your property is within that, those guidelines set for by the, um, you know, the housing authority uh, in determining whether your prop, your price for your rental is reasonable. So typically what will happen is that if it's not, then they'll counter whatever you're asking. So if you're asking for $2,000 and uh, and they say, well, houses around here are going, or apartments around here are going for $1,500, they may come back and say, well, we can pay you $1,550. And, uh, you know, if that's, if you're okay with that, we're good to go. If you're not okay with it, you can deny it or you can, um, you know, provide some comparables to hopefully, uh, you know, uh, support your case for a higher rent. Okay, let's have a look. That's a good question today. Antonio Brown. Hi, Antonio. Can you describe how to check for evictions or failure to pay rent with Baltimore prospective tenants? Thanks. Uh, I don't do anything in Baltimore, so um, I'll just keep it generic and hopefully uh, it uh, can cover uh, Baltimore. So eviction checks, uh, as part of the screening process, um, you know, you should check the public records and do a background search on your prospective tenants. People lie. And, um, you know, in fact, last week, uh, one of my properties, uh, which is available, uh, somebody came in and uh, filled an application. And a lot of the information on the application was bogus, was, was not true. Uh, the current landlord, previous landlords, it was just false information. I was able to catch it uh, and caught them lying. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but people lie. And, uh, and so, therefore, it's really important to, to, to know who you're dealing with and to check people out uh, in terms of their rental history, in terms of their credit history, in terms of their eviction history, and so on. So I know now... Uh, you know, some jurisdictions are cutting back or trying to, um, you know, limit your ability to check into people's backgrounds, especially eviction courts. 
uh, I know in Washington DC they've sealed a lot of that stuff up so you you you, you may not know and um, so you want to contact your current landlord previous landlords that's usually helpful you want to do a um, you know background search there's still websites and tools that you can go to uh, I always like to do a home visit uh you can do a social media checks i mean there's lots of things you can do um you know as part of the process in screening your tenants because if you just get the wrong person in your house you are setting yourself up for a disaster you're setting yourself up for failure and it's really important to know who you're dealing with uh and that the person that you the person that they say they are is in fact who they are um as I said before last week Someone just lied. They said their landlord was A when in fact it was B. Uh, and some landlords will go along with the program just to get this person out of the house. So you got to be careful. Uh, it could be done, uh, but please, uh, you know, be cautious. Uh, get lawyers uh, Thank you so much. Good to know home warranty companies have worked for you. Some I have asked about it said they had horrible experiences with warranty companies. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had mixed feelings with uh, warranty companies uh some of them uh some of my earlier experiences were terrible uh but i kind of figured out how those guys operate now and uh and so i kind of use it to my benefit uh but i use it because sometimes uh i just don't have time to find people uh when there's an emergency situation or whether there's a repair or maintenance issue you know so i just like to be able to call the home warranty company and uh, they can assign it to a licensed bonded insured company and they are then going to take care of it the tenants know i'm 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 trying to uh, get the matter resolved and we get a licensed bonded insured company to go out there so i like it it's it's not cheap but it's just the cost to do business as far as i'm concerned it saves me time and it allows me to outsource uh, and not get too bogged down with um you know day-to-day -day operations of, uh, of of some of these tenant properties uh background this is antonio uh so 745 antonio uh background again if you got some questions please put them in the chat box um you know i'll be more than happy to answer them uh, i've got a few more minutes otherwise i'm going to wrap it up today um antonio background checks are important i found a pers out i found out a prospective tenant had an open warrant yes uh yeah i mean <laughs> there's so much you can find i mean your job you don't know who this person is and they could be the greatest person in the world or they, or they could be your worst nightmare they could be a wolf in sheep's clothing you just don't know and uh it's your responsibility to find out who you're dealing with is this person who they say they are um uh, I've, I've said before, i've had people lie about who they are I've had people lie about where they worked. I've had people lie about their landlords. I've had people lie about, you know, if they've been evicted. I've had people lie right in my face. And, uh, you know, and it's it's easy to get someone in your house, but it's a lot more difficult to get them out once they're in. So your job is to make sure that you understand who you're dealing with. And, uh, you know, the, the background of this person. Uh, and then you can make... Uh, I don't know, informed decision as to whether to let them rent your place or not give them the keys because once they have the keys and they have a lease in their hand then the dynamics can change and they do change especially if you're in a jurisdiction which is very tenant friendly okay so uh, i'm going to kind of wrap it up uh, unless you've got a couple more questions uh again if you um if you have any uh one-on-one -on -one, if you want to go and spend more time with me one-on-one -on -one, to answer any specific question, your situation, any problems and challenges that you're experiencing, uh, you can always reach out to me uh, to book a one-on-one -on -one, uh, Zoom session with me. Uh, you can go to my uh, website, uh, joeasamoa.com, www.joeasamoa.com, and you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me, and I'll be more than happy to uh, you know, try to help you uh, navigate uh, you know, this difficult terrain that we're in. Uh, it's not easy being a landlord, uh, but uh, it's great to own assets and uh, especially appreciating assets and you have uh, great tenants. Uh, great tenants are a blessing. Um, bad tenants are not. So my goal is to help you get good tenants. Okay, so so I think I, th I think I'm gonna call it quits tonight. So it's now 745. So again, hope you had a good time. 
and uh, I look forward to um, you know uh, seeing you at the next event. Well, I'll be here next Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So I've got another question here. Do you require the pet deposit? Should this be held along with deposits or in a separate account? Uh, yeah, if you accept pets, then I would suggest that you do accept a pet deposit. Uh, there are limits, especially if it's a service animal. Uh, you know, so you have to check the, uh, the, the local regulations. Uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, they limit how much the deposit can be. Um, so typically, I think my understanding is that, you know, pet deposits anywhere go for anywhere from like 250 to $500. Uh, you want to have an agreement with the tenant regarding the the, the, the pet and take photographs of the pet, uh, get an idea of their, their breed, uh, their weight, and uh, and so on. Uh, so you don't want a situation whereby you allow one pet and next thing you know, you've got two, three, four, five pets in the house. So you want to have a pet agreement and uh, collect a, a deposit. Uh, I would suggest that you keep the pet deposit in a separate account. Uh, rather than your operational uh, operations account. Uh, so that way, uh, if you need to return it, you can, um, you know, without it being sort of uh, being spent. So my friends, I think I will call it a day for today. And I will see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Have yourself a wonderful weekend. And I'll see you next Wednesday. Take care, guys.